The wheat field of George Rose was the site of horrific fighting at Gettysburg on July 2, 1863. The attacking rebel force eventually contained soldiers from six Confederate brigades from Longstreet's Corps, all of Kershaw's, Semmes's, and Wolford's men, most of Anderson's, and three regiments from the brigades of Robertson and Benning, nearly 8,000 men. The Union defenders came from four different corps, Sickles 3rd, Hancock's 2nd, Sykes's 5th, and Sedgwick's 6th. Nine full brigades and parts of four others, totaling nearly 12,000 men. In all, 20,000 men fought in the grain field in the woods to the west and south. There were over 6,000 casualties. Nearly one of every three soldiers was either killed, wounded, or captured. The day began with the Union Army in control of the non-strategic grain field with the nearest Confederate units in static positions well over a mile to the west, and Longstreet's corps even further, about four miles west. But by 4 p.m., Longstreet's regiments were deployed in lines of battle along the southern end of Seminary and Warfield Ridge, further to the south. And at about 5 p.m., the fortunes of war had placed a bullseye on the wheat field, and for nearly three hours the fighting raged. Control of the ground changed hands numerous times, and by the time the sun had set, the rebels had finally been pushed back. This is the full story of the Gettysburg wheat field on day two, from a few hours after dawn to just after sunset. The video is extracted from over 40 hours of animation, covering the entire Gettysburg battlefield on July 1st and 2nd. For more information about this acclaimed work, visit the website referenced above. Early in the morning of July 2nd, the 2nd U.S. Sharpshooter Regiment from Ward's 3rd Corps Brigade, commanded by Major Homer Stoughton, took up skirmish positions on Little Round Top, in the Plum Run Valley, and at the eastern and western edges of the wheat field. Prior to that point, the soon-to-be-famous wheat field was merely a nondescript field of grain bounded on the south by the woods of the George Rose Farm and on the north by the woods of the Peter Trosel Farm. A finger of Rose's woods extended north of the Rose Farm and covered a stony hill that would also become significant. The hill formed the wheat field's western boundary. The northern end of Hauk's Ridge east of which ran Plum Run, formed the eastern boundary. Burling's brigade was the first significant infantry body to get a look at the wheat field as they traversed the wheat field road from west to east on their way to join Humphrey's 3rd Corps Division on Cemetery Ridge. They were followed by Smith's 4th New York Battery. In Smith's post-war book, a famous battery in its campaigns, 1861 through 1864, he writes, quote, Rejoining the Corps and Division at 9 a.m. No time was lost in leaving the Emmitsburg Road, moving due east as far as the wheat field, into which the battery was taken and parked, unquote. And so Smith's battery becomes the first Union unit posted in the wheat field. While Smith sat in the wheat field awaiting orders, de Chaubriand's brigade, from Burney's division of the 3rd Corps, passed. They were followed by Winslow's 1st New York Battery D. Both will play a major role in defending the wheat field in the afternoon, but on this morning they marched and rolled by on their way to staging positions. Their arrival also completed Sickles' 3rd Corps, with all units now being present on the southern end of the Union line. As the morning hours moved toward midday, and after Buford's cavalry departed from the Union Army's left headed for Emmitsburg, the second U.S. sharpshooter skirmish units assumed the role of guarding that left flank. Stoughton reported that he was ordered by Burney to, quote, deploy my regiment across the ravine 
and through the woods on the right and advance, unquote. As the second U.S. sharpshooters were departing, Ward's brigade was arriving. Harry Fonts in his book, Gettysburg the Second Day, writes, quote, At about noon, at Bernie's order, Ward advanced from his morning location south of the George Weikert farmyard, across the Wheatfield Road, into the wheat field, where it halted in the yet untrampled wheat. Unquote. Ward was in the wheat field for just a few minutes before being shifted further to the left, following Smith's Battery, where both took up positions on and near Devil's Den. Shortly after Ward's brigade departed the grain field, de Chaubriand's brigade traversed it en route to taking up position, his left on the stony hill at the wheat field's western edge, and his right facing south on the hill's southern slope. Winslow's battery followed de Chaubriand and unlimbered near the center of the field. They became the first Union unit to actually deploy in the wheat field, and it was from this position that they would undertake their desperate struggle in a few hours. Sickles was slowly establishing a battle line for his Third Corps, progressively moving to the higher ground to the west and abandoning the southern end of Cemetery Ridge. The controversial advanced Third Corps line was being established, and the wheat field was at the center, between the Peach Orchard to the northwest and Devil's Den to the south. For about the next three hours, the status quo remained the same in the wheat field, but key infantry and artillery movements were taking place to the northwest toward the Peach Orchard and the Emmitsburg Road Ridge Line. But of particular significance to the pending conflict in the wheat field are the numerous movements and positions of Burling's Brigade of Humphrey's Division. The smallest brigade in the Third Corps, a little over 1,300 men, they were ordered here and there numerous times, taking up reserve positions, eventually ending up back in the Trossel Woods across the Emmitsburg Road from the Stony Hill at the northwest corner of the wheat field. Burling's regiment's subsequent movements marked the beginning of the Union Army assuming defensive fighting positions in the field. By 4 p.m., the situation on the southern end of the battlefield was about to boil over. In the preceding hour, Hood's and McLaw's divisions of Longstreet's Corps, 14,500 men plus eight artillery batteries, had taken up positions in and in front of the woods line on the southern end of Seminary Ridge and Warfield Ridge. They were in perfect position to smash Sickles' Corps of 10,700 men and seven batteries, with two more on the way. Longstreet's line was a straight line, a mile and a half long, running north to south, and extending a half a mile beyond Sickles' left. Sickles' line stretched nearly as long, but had a salient at the Peach Orchard, and was manned by 4,000 fewer men. His line was stretched woefully thin, so Burling's reserve brigade was parsed out to strengthen the line. The three largest of Burling's six regiments headed northwest to key spots on the Peach Orchard and Emmitsburg Road front. The three remaining regiments were very small. The 8th New Jersey, the 115th Pennsylvania, and the 6th New Jersey, totaling a little over 500 men, took up lines of battle on the fringes of the wheat field. After the 6th New Jersey was ordered to Hawks Ridge overlooking the Plum Run Valley, Harry Fonts writes, quote, The 8th New Jersey, 170 strong, was led to the southwest corner of the wheat field and posted behind the stone wall there. Unquote. Up until this point, the fighting was taking place to the south. For better or worse, the Confederate focus was aimed at Little Round Top, where Vincent's 5th Corps Brigade had just now arrived, and against Ward's Brigade, anchored at Devil's Den. Ward's line angled to the northwest through Rose's Woods, and de Trobriand could not see any of the early progress of Hood's assault because the woods, 
obscured his view. But Bernie was aware of the developing situation and ordered the 17th Maine to the stone wall between the wheat field and Rose's Woods, and the 40th New York to the main branch of Plum Run at the head of the valley. The wall was a little less than three feet high and looked down a slope that ran through Rose's Woods. The 17th's left extended close enough to the 20th Indiana, whose line was nearly at right angles when they arrived at the stone wall. They were just in time to pour an infilating fire into Robertson's 3rd Arkansas Regiment that was in the midst of a successful countercharge against Ward in Rose's Woods. The 17th Main flanking fire was successful in temporarily stopping the 3rd Arkansas. Fonce writes, quote, The 17th Main fired at a shadowy gray line advancing through the woods across their front at a range of about 75 yards, unquote. But immediately behind Robertson's line were the 1,500 men of George T. Anderson's brigade, and it would be these rebels, coming in from the south through Rose's Woods, that would initiate the first assault on the wheat field. In 1863, the woods were bisected by Rose's Run, a branch of Plum Run to the south. The brook meandered through a marshy area at the southern foot of Stony Hill, where it skirts the northern tree line before turning southeast and running through a depression in the middle of Rose's Woods. While the 17th Maine engaged the 3rd Arkansas from behind the stone wall, the Torbrian's right wing, the 110th Pennsylvania and 5th Michigan, were in position at the southern base of Stony Hill, just to the west of that corner of the wheat field. Sandwiched in between was the 8th New Jersey of Burling's Brigade. These three regiments were hidden from the 17th Maine by a heavy clump of Adlers that partially closed the gap between the south end of Stony Hill and Rose's Woods. Harry Fonts describes the scene as they waited, writing, quote, The regiments along de Chorbrian's line braced themselves for Anderson's blow. The men of the 110th Pennsylvania, who stood in the open ground at the base of Stony Hill, heard a rebel yell from the high ground in the woods beyond Rose's Run. Then a flock of cattle and hogs, flushed by the Confederate line, stampeded by them, and soon they saw a line of rebel legs high on the slope above the stream. The Georgians descended the slope and, under fire, pushed to the cover of Rose's Run's bank." Unquote. With the 7th Georgia stationed on the Emmitsburg Road, guarding the Confederate far right, Anderson was attacking with four regiments, and he was angling straight for de Chaubriand's line at the southwest corner of the wheat field. The 9th Georgia, on the left of the line, was receiving heavy fire off their left flank from the 5th Michigan skirmishers. The three left companies of the 9th were refused to deal with the strong fire, and the regiment descended toward the marshy ground in front of the 110th Pennsylvania and 5th Michigan on the right of de Chorbrian's line. The 8th Georgia was to the right of the 9th and engaged the 8th New Jersey, which had just been joined by the 115th Pennsylvania, both from Burling's brigade. Next came the 11th Georgia, who hammered away at the 17th Maine. The 59th Georgia was on the far right and joined with the 3rd Arkansas in their ongoing fighting with Ward's right regiments and not yet engaging Union infantry in the wheat field. But as Anderson's three left regiments intensified their push toward the Union defensive line at the southern edge of the field, the Georgians took advantage of the cover afforded by the banks of Rose's Run and slid to the left toward the Federals positioned beyond the Adlers. Fearing that they would be flanked by the 8th Georgia, the 115th Pennsylvania pulled back. Shortly after the 115th Pennsylvania pulled back, the 8th New Jersey followed them back into the wheat field. When the 115th Pennsylvania reached Captain Winslow's guns, he convinced them to stay and give the battery some infantry support. Meanwhile, de Torbrian's line held fast. 
the right of Anderson's line had lost its momentum. The 59th Georgia, taking heavy fire from both Ward's 20th Indiana in their front and the 17th Maine on their left flank, began to fall back. Anderson ordered the 11th Georgia to break off the attack. This allowed the 17th Maine to devote more attention to the 8th and 9th Georgia, with three companies changing front to the west and firing into the flank of the Georgians. With the 5th Michigan and 110th Pennsylvania strongly posted on the slope above them, Anderson also realized his left could go no further without support, and so the 8th and 9th Georgia disengaged. The brigade fell back into the woods, intent on reforming and trying again. For now, the wheat field remained under the control of the 3rd Corps. Just prior to, and then during this initial fighting in the wheat field between Anderson's brigade and de Chorbriand's and Burling's regiments, Schweitzer's and Tilton's brigades, of Barnes' 5th Corps division, arrived on the Stony Hill. Schweitzer arrived first. Two of his regiments, the 62nd Pennsylvania and 4th Michigan, took up the positions vacated just minutes earlier by the 17th Maine and 40th New York. The 32nd Massachusetts continued further south and took up a supporting position behind de Trobriand's right regiments, higher up on the slope. When Tilton's brigade of four small regiments, numbering a little over 650 men in total, arrived a few minutes later, they extended the Union line further west, beyond the left of Anderson's Confederates. While none of these regiments of Barnes' division were engaged during the initial wheat field fighting, with the possible exception of the 32nd Massachusetts supporting fire from their higher elevation, their mere presence was certainly an important factor in Anderson's decision to call off his initial and as yet unsupported attack. It is important to note here Schweitzer's and Tilton's initial positions, because their subsequent withdrawal from these locations would be a critical factor in the Union troops surrendering possession of the wheat field during the next phase of the conflict there, minutes later. Anderson's withdrawal marked the beginning of a lull in the initial wheat field fighting. But as Anderson was withdrawing, Kershaw, further to the north, was advancing. Barnes and Tilton were concerned as they watched Kershaw's approach. While his left wing was moving toward the Peach Orchard and the Wheatfield Road, Kershaw's right regiments continued east toward the Rose Farm buildings and the Stony Hill beyond. After pausing briefly at the Rose Farm to untangle their line, the 3rd and 7th South Carolina resumed their advance straight for Tilton's line. And by this time, Anderson's brigade, now commanded by Colonel William Luffman, after Anderson was wounded, had reformed and was beginning their second assault on the wheat field through Rose's Woods. Meanwhile, General Barnes sent word to Schweitzer that when his brigade retired, it should fall back through the woods. It was intended as a precautionary order, but Schweitzer relayed it down to his regimental commanders. The seasoned troops of the two South Carolina regiments coolly advanced and fired, and advanced again. The Federals returned the fire all along Tilton's line. As Anderson's regiments advanced on Kershaw's right, they again struck the fronts of Detrobriand and now Schweitzer and Tilton's left. The 17th Maine held fast to their wall, with Winslow's battery firing over their heads, splintering the trees above the Georgians. Concerned about the fighting to his right, de Chorbriand went to look for support from the 5th Corps troops, reportedly on the stony hill to his right rear, and much to his surprise, he found them falling back through the woods. Kershaw later wrote, quote, As my line ascended to the west slope of the hill, the Union troops defending it just seemed to melt away, unquote. Fonce described the situation, writing, quote, the attack against the hill by the 3rd and 7th regiments, and the presence of the 2nd South Carolina in the low ground off Tilton's right, poised to drive toward the Wheatfield Road in Tilton's rear, 
posed too great a threat to be ignored. Tilton's brigade shifted far right, north through the woods, across the Wheatfield Road, into the wall along the west edge of Trossel Woods, unquote. Apprised of Tilton's move, Schweitzer followed suit, directing his brigade to fall back in good order, without much of a fight, to the southern edge of Trossel Woods along the Wheatfield Road. As de Chaubrian returned to his brigade after searching for Barnes's regiments, the 110th PA and the 5th Michigan on Stony Hill's south slopes still held their ground, but the 5th had lost nearly half its number. With Barnes gone, and Ward's brigade fragmented on his right, de Chaubrian was forced to withdraw back toward Winslow's battery in the Wheatfield Road. As the 17th Maine retreated from the wall, Winslow directed his left section to swing its guns to the left and open with canister on the 3rd Arkansas and 1st Texas of Robertson's brigade, and Benning's 15th Georgia, leading the way and driving Ward's brigade north along Houck's Ridge. Meanwhile, to Winslow's right, as the 110th Pennsylvania and 5th Michigan withdrew, Kershaw's 3rd and 7th South Carolina now focused their fire on the battery from their perch on Stony Hill. The 115th Pennsylvania that had minutes earlier halted their withdrawal at the behest of Winslow, taking up position in support, now surprised the South Carolinians with a sudden charge, momentarily halting their advance. And then they charged again. But the 115th Pennsylvania soon ran out of ammunition, and Kershaw's superior numbers forced both Winslow's battery and the regiment to leave the field. The departure of Winslow's battery enabled Anderson's Georgians to step over the stone wall and enter the field of trampled wheat. The Confederates had taken control of the wheat field, the first of many such changes this day. Font summed up the situation this way, writing, quote, McLaw's division had finally advanced. Kershaw's brigade had joined forces with Anderson's brigade on Hood's left, and the two brigades had driven Tilton and Schweitzer's brigades from the Stony Hill, and de Trobran from the wheat field. This success, coupled with the eviction of Ward's brigade from its position at Devil's Den, meant that the whole left wing of Sickles' line had been smashed." Unquote. Anderson's foothold in the grain field and Kershaw's perch on the stony hill overlooking it, would be short-lived positions. It was about 5.30 p.m., and there would be another two hours of gruesome fighting yet to come. De Trobrian still had some fight left, and Union reinforcements were minutes away. But so too were two additional fresh rebel brigades. This fight had only just begun. Visit our website to register to use this app and explore anywhere, anytime, on the battlefield. www.civilwaranimatedbattles.com